Hello, hello, I'm back reviewing Black Clover Volume 9. For this one, I thought that the wrap up for the Temple arc, I don't know, would just felt a little bit quick to me. At least compared to a few of the other arcs. It's literally feared in this one that the head priest had no idea that the stone was in the temple. And that he found out out about it because he apparently read their minds. But that also just raises the question of how did he not know that the stone was in the temple in the first place? Because we don't get that much with the underwater temple. We don't get much of the town surrounding it. Or kind of like the people and everything. But it seems like it's been here for a long time because they have what appears to be a whole culture culture. Like they have, you know, building set up, they appear to have this whole religion set up under the, under the water. Like they apparently have this deal in place with the land, like they... We know it's been, like I think it's at least been a couple of decades because it seems like the head priest has been in that position for like years now. And so... It is like how they not know the stone was there because if it's something that these people are coming after, then you would think that at least the head priests would know. Because it's, I think I mentioned before that I read up a little bit later. Like I just finished writing my review for the Folium 11, I think it was, with the which Queen, she states that the magic stones are actually pretty po powerful. So it's like, and it's actually very difficult for people to get into the underwater temple because we see Noelle having a pretty difficult time apparently trying to keep a spell intact, I think it was. Trying to navigate like the ocean to try and get there. And so unless someone hit this stone in the temple when they first started going down there I just didn't tell anyone for some reason even though these are apparently pretty important stones to the eye of the midnight sun or oh, they found the stone heard about the underwater temple stuck the stone in there and again just never told the head priests or, or maybe like the previous head priest just never got the time to tell the current one about the stone in there. Or maybe they just figured that nobody would know it was down there anyway. And that people wouldn't, maybe people wouldn't be able to get down there because the currents are so strong. And it's like they, the currents become less strong. I think it's during a full moon or it's just something like once a month. They would have an easier time, but even the easy time is difficult to get in there, so maybe that's why. Because I don't think there's ever confirmation that the Saucy Village, Mayo, or Fregolian ever knew what the stones did. Because it just seems like they had the stones, but were never told anything about it. We do see a little bit more of Noelle and Conhorno's friendship. I kind of wish we could see more of it later on because Kohono reappears. This also makes me think of Vanessa and Noelle's friendship because in the beginning we do have Vanessa offering to teach Vanessa how to console a magic and we literally see her taking Noelle and Asta to the one town where I think it was Asta had taken the exams in order to try and help Noelle get like a magic item better control it but I think outside of that we don't see the two of them interacting that much like we never get a scene of like Ashta walking into the dining hall and seeing Noel and Fnasha like talking or something and we get I think it was a little scene in the one of the previous films of Noel thinking of Fnasha like teaching her but I kind of wish we got to see more of the friendship like on screen, even, even if it's just like, like I said, Ashta walking in one morning and seeing Fnaz and Noah like talking to each other. And so then it does start to get into the, kind of like the next little arc. 
where we get introduced to Fenrir's younger brother, Langris, who actually is like a pretty terrible person. He was the Langris was the one who took over as head of the household after Fenrir. Like I think he just left his family. Like I don't think he talked to them that much anymore. And it, both he and his brother use spatial magic, but Langris is much more offensive with it. Well, Fenrir is more, I don't know, like it's like defensive about it, more like support where he opens portals for other people to jump through them to attack, generally just for teleportation. Well, not teleportation, just get into places easier. And we finally get Gino back. Because I think it's been a while since he showed up. I think the last time he showed up was for the capital and facing arc, I think. Yeah, I think that's the last time he showed up in the manga proper. Yami, Sami, Asta, and Fenral had gone to the capital to tell Aunt Julius about what happened in the underwater temple. And so they were talking, and then they get a report from Marx, who tells them who tells them that they're being faded by the Diamond Kingdom, and that the Golden Dawn have already arrived. And so, like, I wish that there was at least one scene of us seeing the Golden Dawn hideout of like just you know ha- hanging out there, and then them coming in and saying. Hey, we're being invaded. We're gonna make up this team, you know, come along. Because, like, I think I've said that, like, we've barely seen, you know, hanging out in the Golden Dawn. Like, he became, like, you know, was a pretty prominent, roughly character in the first couple of volumes. But we haven't seen him since, like, volume four. I think for or like the beginning of five, I think. I think he was supposed to be set up as the one of the main characters. Like he's Asta's main rival or they grew up together. But we haven't seen him so up that much. So it would have been nice to just to have a little scene of him learning this information and agreeing to go. But also I do kinda like the fact that even if he hasn't shown up that much, it seems like he's getting stronger. And that he at least has some sort of life that we just don't see. Because when he shows up with Claus and Mimosa during the one temple arc in like volume two, he has like this very specific dynamic with the two of them. When he shows up, he seems to have some sort of relationship with like Langris. He seems to be talking to Sailor Lord more. Like, he seems to be training with her quite a bit where they can do a bunch of spells together. So it seems like he's doing stuff outside of what we see him do in the main plot. So this kind of like that. And we also get to see more of Captain William Fonsens, who is the captain of the Golden Dawn. We don't see him that often. In the story, he is the one character who's touted as being next in line for the Wizard King. And we get to see what his magic is. It's called World Tree Magic. And we see him use one huge spell that would attack all of the enemy mages. And it only seems to capture the enemy mages and no one else. Or well, this mo- uh, most of them. A few of them get free. And one of them is the guy from the temple arc who uses smoke magic. He had it, he escapes yet again with some of his friends. And he goes back to the diamond kingdom to tell them what happened. And so Yami, we could see more of Yami being intelligent. Where he picks up on the fact that William and Luke have similar voices and builds. And key so he goes to try and talk to him about what's going on so he wants to get to the bottom of this and ends up questioning really i mean we get to see more of his backstory where he was ostracized by arthur nobles 
for being an illegitimate child of a noble who isn't named, but then his heir had died and so he was taken in, being the next heir. But also he has very bad uh, scarring on his face that Julius had bought him a mask to try and help William's relationship with Julius' face similar to the one Yami has with him, where he tried to help both of them out when they when they were younger. I think it's stated that the two that both Yami and William have known each other for a couple of years now, and uh, it seems like William has the same level of trust in Julius that Yami has. And so even though Yami is suspicious of him, he seems to believe him. And I'm also I'm also assuming that Yami believes that Julius trusts him and doesn't view him as an enemy. He probably believes that if Julius trusts him and doesn't suspect him of anything, then he should believe him. Because of how much Yami trusts Julius, because it seems like Julius is the, Julius is the only one that Yami has a bunch of respect for. Like, he seems to kind of respect the other captains in a, se in a way where he respects their skill in a way, in like combat and knowing what they're doing, but that's about it. Whereas with like Julius, he seems to hold him in a much higher regard because of everything that Julius has done for him over the years. And it seems like the only other captain he actually kind of likes, or this kind of implied to like, is Jack. Because I think it's said that the two of them hang out sometimes and go like drinking and and everything. And I think he has some res a bit more respect for frequently and I think but that's about it and so I also kind of wish that we had more backstory for the who the noble was that is William's dad but I don't think it would matter that much to the actual like plot but more just like world building aspect to it because I after this I don't think we get that much and then we get the scene where the one guy goes back to the diamond kingdom and we see Maus again. Because it's been a while since we've seen him. I think it's he appeared in Film Toon 3, I think. It was also implied that he was getting all of, all of his memories back. And so now we get to see what he's been up to since we last saw him. Yami and Asta head back to the capital, I believe. Because I, I think they were nearby the capital, capital anyway. So he takes him to a, a man named Owen who's older than Yami, but they've known each other for years. This Owen is a healer who works directly for the Wizard King. And the two of them apparently are friendly enough that they go out drinking a couple times. Yami, I told him about Asta. I also just noticed that looking back, he has Nero just chilling out on his head. So I think, yeah, Nero had gone with them to the diamond, when the diamond kingdom attacked, but I didn't realize that they came when Asta was talking with Owen. And so Fenrir had come back, Well, I think he went to go visit Asta. I did kind of like this moment, where it does kind of show that Fenrir is a lot nicer than he seems, because he at least seemed to care enough about Asta to come and visit him while he's being healed. And I do like we're getting more with Fenwell. The last two films really start to give him more development where we see him interacting with his brother, talking about how he doesn't want him insulting insulting the black balls. Kind of make like Yami proud of him. Both Owen and Asta don't realize that Fenwell's outside when Owen tells him that he can't heal his arms because they'll one, badly damaged from Fido attacking him, but there's also some sort of ancient curse on them that seems like it's preventing people from healing them, but possibly also from his arms 
healing naturally, maybe? I don't know, they don't go into too much detail about the ancient curses. Only that there's some sort of ancient curse on his arms. But I also wonder if Fido did it intentionally, intentionally or not. Because his Fido was using the ancient beast magic that we don't know that much about. So either he had used the magic to specifically go after Ashita's arms because he knows he can't use magic and the only weapon she has are his swords. Oh, it was just kind of an accident when he attacked Ashita and broke his arms. I don't think it's ever, st it's not stated. His arms can't heal and Owen says, I'm sorry, but with the magic we have, I can't heal you. And for and they had gone back to the Blight Bulls hideout and Ashita tried to pretend like everything was fine. And so Fenrir tells everyone after Ashita left the party that Jami had thrown for everyone for managed to get it up to zero stars because they were like negative 50 or something beforehand. And so they're now at a nice even zero. <laughs> they all go to try and almost like comfort Ashita. Maybe we'll just see what he's doing because he ends up going off and stuff like this little cliffside. And he starts remembering all of his battles and, you know, but he clearly he's not going to give up. And it ends with Fanasa thinking magic from that country might be able to save you. And so while I did kind of enjoy this one, like I do like the fact that we're getting a bit more plot progression. At least a little bit, like things t seem to be ramping, ramping up a little bit with the Eye of the Midnight Sun with the Diamond Kingdom because the that Diamond Kingdom had been set up in like volume, like the little half of volume two roughly. And I'm glad we're getting more of them. Like I don't think it's been mentioned in a while, but there was the one guy who was who had disguised himself as one of the captains during the meeting when they revealed who the traitor was and we still don't know who they disguised themselves as and so I don't think that's been brought up in a little while and so it is like I kind of wish that that would get brought back up in a little bit and I am kind of glad that this film kind of sold Yami being like I said kind of Trying to figure out the mystery of who the Eye of the Midnight Sun leader might be. Because he realizes that Licht and William have similarities and he's known William long enough that he doesn't like attack him right away. Yami is like kind of impulsive and hot headed, but he at least seems to like listen to William long enough to hear his story, sees that he's not telling the truth, but doesn't seem to want to do anything. And so I'm also kind of sad that we don't get to see that much of Gordon. He's also one of the members of the Black Bulls that we barely see him in the story. Like, even though we don't see, like, we see Sami quite a, quite a bit. I feel like we know a bit more about her in a way than we do Gordon. Like, he's just kind of in the background. And I completely forget about him when they go to the underwater temple. Like, I think Ghost doesn't appear that much. He had his big moments in uh, volume like 5 and 6. But it doesn't appear that much since. And he got more development. So it's only been like 9 volumes. But we don't really see him do anything. Even Grey got a moment in the last volume using our transformation magic. And we also did kind of know what she did in the beginning because she transformed into Asta when they first met and we're kind of talking in the dining hall. And so far, Gordon doesn't feel like that much of a character. And while I'm kind of, while I do kind of like Sami, I think she's kind of funny. She kind of, she's kind of entertaining to like read it and watch. But I kind of wish we would, we would get, I don't know, like a little bit more with her. And like, I mean, we do get quite a bit with her of her fighting people, but she does seem to act more like a comic relief, which is fine. 
I think for like the comic relief character, it's just actually pretty like kind of good. And I do like the fact that Dino and Asta are still friends, even though they're rivals. Like I do like the fact that they've known each other for years, and even though they have the same dream, they're not really like fighting or anything. Like I mean, they do fight, but they're still like pretty friendly about it. Like every time they meet, they make a bunch of like snarky comments to each other. You know, seems to really care about Asta. And same thing with Ashta to you know. So even though I like the fact that they don't see each other that often, they're still really good friends with friend with each other. Yeah, I think that's everything for now. Peace.